Everyone knows that a good movie needs to follow the rule, tell, not show. In other words, you never want to show the viewer anything. Let's use our main character, Jake, as an example. The last thing you would want to do as a filmmaker here is show us anything cool. Don't let your audience see him do anything special, say anything special, meet anyone special, or really do anything of significance whatsoever. Instead, the best way to go about this is to introduce another character we really don't like or care about and have them fangirl over his achievements and tell us how great he is. Did that haircut just call you Pentecost? As in badass stacker Pentecost? Pilot of Coyote Tango Hero of basically the whole world. In fact, do this with the Jaegers as well. Instead of showing us how the Jaegers fight and let us in on some of that juicy action, allowing your audience to get a feel of how each one is unique and special in their own way. Your main goal is to disappoint the audience by again letting that same random character nobody cares about tell us how great the Jaegers are. Oh my god. That, that is Valor Omega. This, ladies and gentlemen, is peak film writing right here, and a true showcase of complete mastery over the basics and fundamentals of filmmaking. But of course, we couldn't do any of that interesting, exciting exposition everyone's so eagerly waiting to hear about without having the random characters we don't care about. So let's talk about how to make the most interesting character in cinema. Everyone thinks that part of creating a likable character is their relatability to the audience, having a part of their character's life feel like it's something you could see in real life, that grounded, realistic part of the character that helps tie fiction to reality, and making the crazy stuff they do later on as a hero be more acceptable because of it. Like for example, Spider-Man literally being a high school student. I can't go to Germany. Why? I, I got homework. I'm gonna pretend you didn't say that. No, I'm being serious. However, we don't do that here. People say all this crap about being able to uh, step in another person's shoes or something, uh, wa walking in their foot, stealing their shoe, I, I, I don't know, something like that. Doesn't matter to me. The most important part about designing a character is to make sure they're insanely smart and just good at everything from the very beginning for no good reason. Or at least no reason the audience can see. The last thing you want to do is give them a reason for being who they are. It's important to just let them be so special and awesome, because that's what people really like to watch. A character that is just great because they're great, and not because they work towards it. Now, once you've created this character, it's also important to make side characters that people also couldn't care less about. Give them as little depth as possible, and really desperately try to use these characters nobody cares about to make the audience care about the main character that nobody cares about. The Hook Remember back in English class when we first learned how to write a hook in storytelling? Well, Uprising is a beautiful example of how you do this properly. You see, for the entire first half of the movie, we as the audience really don't even know why we're watching any of it. Only when Obsidian Fury shows up that we actually have something to think about, like where this sexy Jaeger came from. Other than that, there's nothing to keep you as an audience member invested. The characters? Hell no. The plot? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out. The action? Literally the very first thing we immediately get introduced to is the kaiju and their attack on our world. Immediately! Right off the bat, we instantly know what this movie is about, what we can expect, and why we as an audience should keep watching. The hook is so flippin' strong. What do we immediately get introduced to in Uprising? A dude we've never seen before in a party. I mean, gosh, I, I'm sorry, I, I really just can't live without knowing what happens to this incredibly likable character. Imagine going through life not knowing what kind of toppings he puts on his ice cream, or not knowing he eats directly off the fucking spoon used to scoop ice cream from the container. What the fuck? My life just wouldn't be the same. How many damn toppings do you need? Leave my toppings be, man. Don't mess with my damn toppings. He's not someone who's struggling to live in this deserted city. He's not someone who's trying to live up to be something greater. He's just kind of universally known by all the characters to be a degenerate. Oh, and uh... Try not to steal anything while you're here. And then Mako dies and all of a sudden he becomes the hero of the story. No real character development process or anything, just Mako dies and he gets all sad about it and suddenly becomes a great leader. Going back to his crazy origin story, he's a smuggler who trades Jaeger parts for 
bags of cookies and cereal. Not to mention, all of this stuff is never seen or heard of again for the rest of the movie. You would think that they might as well tie it in somehow. Like, maybe when the base gets blown to bits, he pulls on his connections from his old life and gets some extra help. Nope, never mind, they fixed the robots in like two hours anyway, so no help needed, guys. Which kinda sucks, because if you're gonna do all this stuff in the beginning, then actually do something with it. Instead, it's simply used to introduce us to our next main character, girl that is smart. She somehow builds an entire Jaeger by herself. What happened to the whole, the world needed to pool its resources together to build the Jaegers. These robots are the pinnacle of human technology and ingenuity. Each one costs hundreds of billions of dollars. And they're not just badass, but also a sign of humanity's united effort against the Kaiju. But an uprising? Nope, let's, let's just throw that all away. But while giant metal robots punching monsters is cool, it just doesn't work if your characters and world building isn't there. The world doesn't feel alive like the original Pacific Rim. Even details like having a black market that sells parts of the dead kaiju's corpses just makes the whole world feel so much more realistic, because this is actually something that would happen. These guys are selling lice and organs and all this other crap. This place is heaven! That's a, that's a lift land from a category two! What are you working on here? Is this a cuticle? Even when the Jaeger is first leaving the launch bay, we see all the people and workers, the helicopters flying around, the engineers securing and checking different components to make sure things are working. And when the Jaeger is getting pushed out, we can see the heavy machinery used to bring it outside. A machine that some of us have actually seen in real life because this is very similar to what they use to move rockets around. And even when the Jaeger has been launched, they still need to calibrate to check if things are working. Again, it's tying things to real life, just like how we see pilots, for example, check different flaps on the plane's wing to make sure things are working before taking off. None of this detail is shown in Uprising. So it's not a surprise that not only does the world feel dead, but the Jaegers also feel so much more distant from reality. Not to mention, the last half of the movie feels like it could have been written by a five-year-old. Like seriously, they probably went up to little Timmy and were like, hey little Timmy, do you have any ideas for this movie? And little Timmy was like, okay, so there are these big thrones, but really, it's the monster controlling the thrones. And they attack the robots, and all the robots go boom. And then, <laughs> and then they open a portal for the monster to come through. But then, the lady closed the throne, and they all go boom. And then, and then the breaches are closed. But wait, the breaches didn't close fast enough, and three monsters came through. And then, the Pacific Wind music starts playing, and and the robots are all fixed in like two hours. And then the monster attack the mountain and want to make it go boom. But the robot fly on the rocket all the way to Japan really quick. And then the robot fly again like Superman and kills the big monster in a huge explosion. <laughs> Wow, Timmy, that's pure genius. You know what? Little Timmy should write the next Fast and Furious movie. I think he'll be perfect at it. <laughs> Family. Okay, silliness aside, I will say we did get a cool Jaeger vs. Jaeger scene when Obsidian Fury popped up out of nowhere. This is basically the one good thing that came out of Uprising. However, even with the slight coolness of this battle, you can't help but be reminded of how much better it would have been if it had the realistic weight and feel of the Jaegers that Pacific Rim had. This building right here should just have a massive hole in it. I mean, this robot weighs like thousands of tons. There's no way this building is capable of sustaining that weight. Oh my god. Oh, hell. Since we're on the topic of movement, let's talk about how this could have been so much better. Part of what made the movement of Pacific Rim's Jaegers convincing was how the pilots themselves moved, and a quick comparison will show what I'm talking about. In the original, they had to push and pull on the mechanical parts connected to their limbs, straining to lift the arms or the legs whenever they move. This seriously helps emphasize the size and weight of these machines, as it feels like they're genuinely lifting hundreds of tons with each movement of their body. But in Uprising, it 
looks like they're running on a treadmill. Not only does the pace at which they're moving not always match the actual movement of the Jaegers, but they're literally just moving at normal speed. I mean, look at these punches. They're not slowed down at all. There's no weight behind any of this. We also have to keep in mind a key trait that makes things realistic, whether it be a fictional character, world, or giant metal robot, and that is imperfection. In the real world, nothing is perfect. There's always some flaw, some aspect that could be better. Our giant metal Jaegers are extremely powerful, but they're slow, heavy, and can cause tons of damage to the city, like completely destroying the roads that it steps on. In Uprising, however, the movie seems to toss a lot of these imperfections away. For example, when they walk around in the city, only the first few inches of road or pavement get crushed. Look at how it is in the original. That is how a road is supposed to act under this sort of weight. This, this is bullshit. But going back to imperfections, the world of Pacific Rim is filled with them, with some of them even helping the world building as well as advancing the plot. Like for example, the wall of life completely failing. Less than an hour. That thing. Went through the wall like it was nothing. Not to mention all the problems with the Jaegers, like the early models permanently damaging their pilots because of the neural load. And we weren't just told that, but we also saw it through Marshall. And as for our main characters, well, Rally and his brother are far from perfect. Before we even got to see them in action, we already knew their flaws. Before we saw what made them great, we first saw what made them human. Time is 2 a.m. Yep. And that's how it should be, as that makes everything all that more interesting. In Uprising, however, this is not the case, and I'll use Amara as an example. Right off the bat, she's constantly one-upping Jake. She steals the valuable component before he does. She builds a Jaeger by herself. The cops are led to her hideout, and Jake is the one at fault. She uses Scrapper for the first time, and it works flawlessly. Everything being shown is just pushing her higher and higher up. But as the film does this, it's simply pushing the audience farther and farther from the possibility of liking her as a character. Now, in my last Pacific Rim video, I already talked about how to make a Jaeger feel good. Instead of repeating myself, I want to point out some other elements that help create a terrifying sense of scale. Like, for example, rain. Yes, rain. Really, any sort of particles work, like dust and sand, but water and rain works especially well because it makes stuff look cool in the process. Look at how the rain bounces off its skin and really makes you feel the immense scale of this creature. Not to mention it just blends perfectly with a nighttime setting, like in the original Pacific Rim. So what's up with rain? Why does it make stuff look big? Because it allows you to have a constant thing to compare the Jaeger's size to. We all know how water works and we all know how it flows no matter what type of object it's flowing off of. We've seen enough of that happen in real life. So just by looking at the way the water flows off the Jaeger or how it's punches affecting the rain, you can often instantly tell just how fast or big that object really is. Even in shots where you don't have people or cars or whatever everyday normal sized objects are there to give you that sense of scale, it really is quite easy to imagine just how big these things really are. But not only that, water also allows you to gauge the power of something. Like for example, look at the nuke getting blown up underwater. This is a perfect example, as you can easily gauge the scale of the explosion and the power of the explosion with a blast of the nuke blowing all the water away before it comes crashing back. This type of thing is also used a bunch of times in animation, and I'll take One Punch Man for example. When the Sea King monster punches Saitama, the shockwave from the punch is so powerful it stopped the rain for a few seconds before it eventually started falling again. The show then uses this as a comparison to show how strong Saitama's punch is compared to the Sea King, as his just <laughs> stopped the rain completely. If there was no rain in the sea, you as a viewer really would have no good way to compare the power between these two punches. Hence, rain is awesome for things that are big or for things that are powerful. Let's talk about one of my favorite aspects of a lot of films, and that's sound. Think of any incredible movie, and it probably has a phenomenal score, with some of them being some of the most memorable tracks we've ever heard. Like for example, the theme for Interstellar or for Man of Steel. And yeah, Pacific Rim's theme is one of those memorable ones. I mean, no one is ever gonna forget how this sounds.
Imagine if Pacific Rim didn't have this theme and instead had some generic battle music playing. It just wouldn't be the same and this film would be much less enjoyable, let alone regarded as a masterpiece by so many. But simply having a good score doesn't mean anything if you don't use it well. Any great film knows exactly how to use music to bring more impact to the events on screen. Like for example, the transition from a Chinese to Soviet style of music when Crimson Typhoon and Cherno Alpha are fighting. Ladies and gentlemen, the final and arguably most crucial part to creating an Oscar-worthy film like Uprising is to make sure that you follow the 9-minute rule. In other words, you cannot pass the 9-minute mark for showing anything that is interesting. Like the drones, for example. For such a large portion of the movie, it's been building up hype around these drones. They're going to take over the Jaegers, pilots will become obsolete, the world can be protected at any place at any time, and we can have thousands of these. Having Charlie secretly turn these into a kaiju super weapon, opening a bunch of breaches all across the world, turning the drones into kaiju Jaeger hybrids and having them attack the Jaeger bases. Now we got some stakes, now we have something to work with. You know, maybe this movie isn't that bad after all. I really wonder how they're gonna get out of this one. This actually has me on the edge of my seat. Wait, how long has it been since the scene started? <laughs> The went house disabled the drones. Yeah, the boss lady just taps the off button and they all explode. What the fuck was the point of all of this? All the build up, all the exposition, all the stakes being created just to throw them away within 9 minutes. Oh right, it, it's the 9 minute rule, how stupid of me. You can't have anything interesting on screen for more than 9 minutes. Oh, how foolish of me to forget the most crucial rule in filmmaking, that, that's my bad guys. This is of course yet another excellent demonstration of film perfection. Sorry.